Good morning. So as Simon mentioned, we're going to be talking about a particular project that we worked on recently um, using data mining techniques to identify students who were at risk of leaving CSU. This is a presentation we put together for a conference in Brisbane a couple of weeks ago. So it, it basically tells the story of the project from the very start to where we are today. And we're actually going to pull Peter Greening in at the end to give some you know, point in time feedback on how things are going with the solution that we developed. So um, I'll get stuck into it. So before I run through the agenda, I want to let you know up front what the three takeaway items are that I want you to remember from this presentation. Uh, the first one is that this solution has been all about the data. So we're very much constrained and need to be planning around the data that we have available or the data that we were able to source relatively quickly. Um, which leads to the second point was this project was, was aimed at being a very quick win. So we weren't trying to solve every problem in the learner analytics or any sort of analytical space similar to what's been talked about. We were just looking to solve a specific issue in a very short time. But the system is, is expandable, so what we've been able to deliver is something that we can make a bigger solution in time if required. And finally, in putting this solution together, we had to very carefully consider the audience that we're going to be using the system. So that's the, just the three takeaways up front. So what I'll do, I'll run through the background of the project. Um, we'll go from the very start when we were asked to look into a particular issue through the formal project definition. Then Tim will talk through some more detail on the actual data mining techniques that he used. And we'll look at some challenges and um, where, where the project is up to now and what, what we have to do next, basically. There'll be a little bit of time for questions and answers at the end. So as, as you can imagine, this all started with a request from the business. So we, we were asked by the Dean of Students, how do we best identify students who are at risk of leaving CSU? And there were a few different solutions that were being considered for this problem. My team were asked to consider the different solutions and come up with a recommendation. And Tim relatively quickly said, I think we can do this in-house. Um, we've got the software tools and the expertise, but we also flagged pretty early on that we'd probably need some external help because of the timeframes involved. So that was the start of the project. The first thing we did looking at this was to consider what our team already knew about attrition. And just to reinstate the, the definition of attrition that we're using here is the proportion of students who don't take any subjects in their second year. So this is the measure that we were trying to predict. Um, so fortunately the team, even before my time, the team had done quite a lot of analysis work in this area. And, had talked to a number of different stakeholders about their opinions on the factors that contribute to attrition. And so there was, a, there was a fairly good understanding that most of the key factors were all around aptitude and engagement and the data backed that up in, in prior analysis. Uh, so then at this point we went through and actually started to define the project formally. Um, we were told at this point by the Dean of Students that this needed to be delivered in before the start of the next session. And we were actually in December of 2013, having to deliver an end result in production by end of February 2014. So that, that was um, quite fast. So we very quickly grabbed some, um, lined up some extra resources to help with the, the larger piece of technical work, which is the data integration. First step in defining the project was to properly articulate what the business problem was that we were trying to resolve. And student attrition is the critical issue here across all universities, but particularly at CSU because we have such a large distance population. If you look at the stats, the overall attrition for CSU usually sits around the 20%, but if you looked at just internal students, it would be 13%, and for just distance students, it's around 30%, so there's quite a big gap. The idea of the project was that if we can identify the students who are most at risk of leaving, then we could the, the support team could focus their strategies to help these students. So we understood the problem. Um, what we then went and did was broadly outline the solution that we were going to be delivering. And this involved four steps. The first was to just redo that data mining, the, the analysis step, and identify what exactly the factors were that we needed to source data from. Um, second step was to then populate the data warehouse on a regular basis with the data required to assess those factors. 
then we went and built, we would have to build a predictive model and then produce a report that, that allowed the support team to go ahead and help the students. So that was broadly speaking the solution we were going to deliver. We defined up front what the key success for the, pro how, how we were going to measure success broadly speaking in the project. Um, it was really important we did this because we weren't going to have time to do a detailed requirements gathering exercise. So we needed to be clear on, on what our target was. We decided that the key to success for this project was identifying the students who were most at risk um, and also providing adequate information for the support team to, to put together their intervention strategies. And just noting that we didn't include actual lowering of attrition for CSU because although that was a desired outcome, it was outside the control of the project team. So, um, so again, we didn't have time to do detailed requirements analysis, so we had a fairly high level look at what the use cases were going to be for the system. We were looking at who would be using the system, what they'd be using the system for, and we talked to a, a large number of people, although the student outreach team were our predominant users, um, we also talked to senior managers and various representatives from the, the faculties about how in future this may be used to get a broader understanding. Um, and then finally we, we looked at the business deliverables. So once we understood the problem we were trying to solve um, and the, the various ways the system could be used, we then locked in, here's what we're going to deliver. So we, we committed to delivering a ranked list of students based on their current behaviour. So this had to be a, a near real time assessment of a student's risk and, and their current results basically. And then we also committed to providing basic student information about the students on the list and a report on what factors may have contributed to their risk status. So it's not necessarily showing the exact path of the model say this is exactly how they, we came up with this risk, risk status, but it showed the factors that were likely to contribute. Um, we put together the schedule and the budget. As, as I said before, this was a pretty scary schedule <laughs> that we had to try and meet. And we ended up deciding to release this in a pilot phase because of just to mitigate that risk somewhat. Um, we had the Christmas period in the middle and we did plan around that, but. It, it's always a bit of a gotcha in planning that Christmas downtime can be a lot bigger than it looks on paper. So we, we were pretty tightly constrained at the start. And then we also defined the team and we had a very dispersed team all the way from Brisbane down to Albury. So we, we met on a daily basis and, and kept track of things that way. So that was how we defined the project. We were basically ready to go and we presented that and gained approval to go ahead and I'll hand over to Tim to talk about a bit more detail about how data mining was used in the solution. So, thanks, Tim. Before I, get, before I dive in, I just wanted to make a comment on, on history. Um, and I don't think Nina's here today, but so we started this work with when Nina was, was in Julie's position, Nina Clemson, who's now working with Ellen on smart learning. Uh, we tabled a report to Senate in 2009 on uh, talking about the factors which lead to attrition and, pro and, and success. Those reports came from analysis we'd done using the same techniques we've done here. This report was really our chance to operationalise that. So in the past, it's all been about analysis. We've used these tools behind the scenes and no one's actually seen the output of that, except for in written format. This was a really great chance to actually wind it into the business and actually start using the tool automatically and, um, and, and hopefully spread the benefits of that kind of analysis further. Um, all right, so we, we approached, if you're going to look at identifying students who are at risk or who you wish to contact on a priority basis, who you want to identify as being a, a group, be that students who are going to have poor success or good, or good success or poor attrition or good attrition, um, you can essentially go out, canvas the neighbourhood, build a rules-based engine, which is what uh, you were needed for a couple of years ago, for example, had great success with. Or you can start to use some of the fancier tools that we have available. We use data mining, specifically an area of data mining called knowledge discovery in databases. Uh, knowledge discovery in databases is all about spotting patterns in the databases that a human may or may not spot because there's a lot of data in databases and it just takes a long time to go over it. And even if, you had, even if you're just sitting there and looking at the correlations between this thing and that thing, it can take a human a long time to discover, um, discover what's in there. The first time we did this, Nina spent a couple of months combing through the pivot tables and came up with pretty much the same things that we came up with in the mining model in about five minutes. So 
it really helps. It does the bits that computers to do well with the data. The problem with patterns, of course, is that um, both humans and computers spot patterns that may be meaningful and non-meaningful. This is the John Snow cholera map from London. Uh, that's a uh, physician in London, cholera epidemic. Started plotting out the deaths, discovered that germs travelled through water and was coming up at the wells rather than travelling through the air. Sparks germ theory has probably saved billions of lives ever since. Uh, this is the Virgin Mary and a piece of toast. Unless you're deeply Catholic, that probably means less uh, in the grand scheme of things. So uh, humans are good at spotting patterns. Computers are good at spotting patterns. We spot patterns differently. It still requires us as, as, us as educators who are aware of the subject area, us as, as uh, you know, data scientists, to find out whether those patterns actually mean anything or are useful or tractable. There's really only a, cu a, a couple of tools we have in the grab bag of knowledge discovery and databases. That's basically it. There's a few sort of more... Uh, basically, anything you do with, with data mining is one of those or a combination thereof. Anomaly detection, association rule learning. So association rule learning, for example, is the basket analysis you see with, uh, with Amazon where they say, you've got these things in your basket, other people also like these things, and then went on to buy this. Please buy this as well because we need your money. Um, Clustering, we all know what clustering and regression is. This is just doing it across n dimensions. So clustering in n dimensional space, it's really hard to visualise, but the computers do it quite well. Um, classification, summarisation. So what we're doing here is classification because we have a great big grab bag of attributes and a dependent variable. And we're trying to find out what the correlations in this great big sum of data, multiple attributes, we're trying to find the correlations, we're trying to rank those, and we're trying to find independencies between those correlations. Uh, in terms of operationalizing data mining, there's really only one model out there because it kind of just says what you need to do. First, you need a business understanding. You need to go to the business and talk to them and say, what, what sort of things do you think impact, uh, impact uh, attrition, which was what we were looking at. And uh, because you need to identify those attributes and make sure you have them, or at least if you don't have them, understand why you can't have them and, and make a good explanation of that. Uh, so we went out and talked to people, uh, lots of people. We also went to the literature. And uh, we also, of course, we've been working with this data for a long time, so we also brought our own, own insights to the table. Data understanding, we have to think about how the data interacts with the algorithms that you're going to use. For example, some algorithms can't use continuous data. You need to categorise those that data. And you also need to think about how you're bucketing, for example, um, age groups. We've got a lot of students who are school leavers. So it doesn't make sense to have 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60. So you've got to think about how you want to be bucketing those, that data. Um, you also sort of need to understand the interdependencies of data. I'll talk a bit about that later. Then there's a modelling process where you actually go through and just run the various algorithms over the data. And knowing how the algorithms work, the weaknesses and benefits of the data, seeing what comes out of those algorithms at the end, you can start to identify things that uh, that might be changed. So say, for example, one, one problem you have is overfitting, where the algorithm comes back and says, we say that John Smith treats 100% of the time. Well, that's great and it's true, but it's useless because that's referring to that one John Smith and he's not back again. Um, so you're trying to make sure that your statements are generic and reasonable and realistic. So. Uh, the other thing you might find is that it says all part-time students have less than one F tool. Also really accurate, also really useless. So this is the process of going through there, finding out all those things. You can't necessarily predict them all, but it'll come out, a model will fall out and you go, oh, well, that's obvious. You might have to recategorise, you might have to change how you're fitting that into the model. You may have to choose a different algorithm. Uh, it's part of the evaluation process. You go back to the business constantly, you check with things, you make sure our base assumptions about the data that we're integrating are accurate. Um, and then finally, deployment. Uh, so when we were choosing factors, we went to, we, we did a couple of things. We went to, saw, to see what the business said. We got a lot of, a lot of uh, statements like uh, low ACS students do poorly. Students who are articulating from TAFE do poorly. Uh, students who are taking more than one FTL in a year perhaps also do poorly. They're overloading themselves. Uh, we look at what the literature says. Overwhelming literature essentially says engagement and aptitude is what it comes down to. So what are the things that we can get hold of that relate to engagement and aptitude? Uh, we have not that many students who come in on the basis of their ATAR, so we really have to look at their performance at the university. 
In terms of, in terms of engagement, we're running in parallel with uh, Paul Bristow, who is in charge of the Hadoop project. Hadoop is the, the tool that you use to process big data. And we were able to get really good um, information about uh, people who are accessing services like forums, people who are accessing the subject outlines using the online tools, accessing forums, which students were accessing the messages in message box. So we had a number of engagement indicators there as well. We had to think about how to, how to use those. So you come up with uh, categories like, did they access their subject outline before the term started or within the first three weeks? Um, and so we, used, we had to shuffle those had to shuffle around the groups that we were using there until we found something that, that seemed to work well enough. Um, we learned by what data we can get. Yeah, it'd be great to stick all our students in their fMRI machine and ask them, are you enjoying university and see which parts of their brain light up? We can't do that. We really were constrained to what's available. Um, the other big issue is how's the data behave over time? If you're really wanting to dive in there in the fourth week of term, and start offering people services, the data you're using has to be available in the fourth week of term. So for example, you can't look at all the assignments they did in the term when you're training the model. We train the model of historical data. So historical data, we know how they did the whole term. We've got to be very conscious when we're training the model that we're only going to have part of that picture. So you've also got to be very careful to group those things in terms of numbers that will be valid right throughout the term. Um, so we found out that a lot of the things we garnered from people weren't actually true. Our low OCS students do slightly better than our non-low OCS students. Uh, students who are articulating from TAFE, they do just fine. They're really quite well prepared for... These aren't universals. There are some, some uh, courses where it's, it's not the case. But you, generally, across the board, our students articulating from TAFE are, are quite fully prepared for, for study. And students who are doing more than a full-time load, those tend to be our better students rather than our worst students. They're the ones who are really punching out to try and get the course done, finished, course done faster rather than those <coughs> students who are tailing off and trying to catch up. Um, the output. So we, we train the model on, on historical data and then we run it on current data. Uh, these are the two key outputs that we, we generated and we gave over to Peter's team at the contact center. No, the contact center, no, what is it? Stuart Average team, sorry. <coughs> Uh, two main outputs. So we pipe all of the risk score. We pipe all the risk scores into the data warehouse day in day out. So you could go into the pivot tables and do analysis. But we produced a ranked list of students, um, which is filterable. And so you could look at just a single session or a particular faculty or a particular school. Generates a ranked list. And when you click on a person in that ranked list, you go through to this information page. So one of the thing, one of the concerns I think was raised quite rightly yesterday a, a fair bit is this score's fine, but how do we know what that score means? And it really comes to the fore where you've got someone who's sitting there on a phone, they pull up a name, they have to ring that person, and they think, why? Why am I ringing this person? How are they going? Is it that they're doing poorly in their subjects, or is it just the demographics that... So we tried to integrate all the important information that we valuable in the sheet. There's a glance panel at the top. For example, at the top we say, assignments attempted, none, this person. Uh, assignments passed, none. Subject out on access, prior session, prior session. Subject portal access, prior session. So they've still done all the engagement things right, but they just haven't started submitting assignments. Demographic and contact details, they're in Wagga, they live in Tamora, uh, they're doing a master's by coursework. Um, down here we can see they've accessed the student portal 231 times. This is clearly not an unengaged student. Um, number of times the subject outline access, 22. And then down here, each of their subjects. Two subjects here, we can see the, did they access the outline for that subject? Did they uh, submit the assignment? Did they pass the assignment? Those sorts of things. So we're really trying to give the person who's making that call. And this is the advantage when we have a very specific use case. We knew exactly what we were delivering. We knew who we were working at, so we worked very closely with Peter and his team to say, what can we put on here that's really useful for you? We've got loads of data. How can we present it best for you? And um, I think it's worked OK, I hope. Um, one of the things, of course, people will find is that you may have a student who's doing four subjects and they're struggling in one. So right away, you can go, have you thought about perhaps taking a lower load? Or, um, but it, it's certainly allowing the Student Outreach Centre to customise 
the particular services offer for each student. Results. Um, so we used, we tried six different algorithms. They all have different strong weak points. Uh, we wanted to use initially a classic decision tree type classification uh, algorithm because they're kind of easy to understand, kind of easy to explain. They have really uh, compelling visualization, which makes it easier to explain to people exactly how the model is working. But one of the problems with decision trees, or two of the problems with decision trees, are um, you're always looking at the most strongly correlated any leaf. Now, so you build a tree. What's the most strongly correlated thing? Split on that, and for each of these leaves, next, choose the next most strongly correlated thing. So it means if you've got something that's really, really, really important, but is never the most important thing, it never turns up in the model. For example, attendance <coughs> mode, we you know, makes the difference between a 13% attrition rate and a 30% attrition rate. But it's never the most important thing. So you build a decision tree and it's never there. It never plays into it. Um, the other problem we had is that because there's a decision tree and you only have a limited number of leaves, you get about 20 scores across the entire student body. So you get 1,000 people with the same top score, um, which makes it operationally difficult to use. It may be that when you look at the error bars, those students possibly deserve all the same score, but it makes it operationally much more difficult to use. Um, we ended up going with neural networks because it sounds really cool. No, that's not, <laughs> not at all. It actually turned out to be uh, the most robust of the data we had. Uh, the lift charts were a little bit stronger. And um, partway through, we discovered that uh, we weren't dealing with an atypical data mining problem. Typically, you go into a data mining model saying, we want to do a classification, and we're going to test the accuracy of the classification model by looking at how well we can predict a particular person is one thing or another thing. And we certainly did all that testing. What we found was that, um, I mean, this is what people know in the room, as you're throwing in more and more attributes, more and more degrees of freedom, the statistical power gets really weak. We're talking about N of 60,000 students. And we were still struggling with significance. Um, so we kind of cheated and changed our definition for success. We looked at the problem that we had. The problem is not we want to point to a student and say this person likely to succeed or fail. We're saying we have finite resources. We can only afford to call 100, 200, 300, 400 people. We want to make sure that that list is the best list possible. They're, we're hitting the most... The people who most we hit more the, the most number of people who can make the best use of that service. So we went and we said, if we picked at random, um, we would find that based on a, a rough average of twenty five percent attrition, one in four people in that list would be someone who was going to attrit. Based on our initial testing, the the current model, the model the model list for these figures are from is slightly worse, but um, based on the current model we're using, if you pick the list of students we tell you to call, two out of three of those students, or in this case, one out of two, or two out of three of those students uh, will be people who are likely to treat. So we've gone from one in four to two in three or one in two. Um, so in that sense, um, based on, again, this is a, uh, it's not particularly relevant. We train on historic data, we hold data aside, we test that historic data. So we haven't yet got the results back for the first time that we've run the program. We'll get those back in probably a year or two's time because attrition is such a lagged indicator. Um, but it seems to be doing the job we need of it. Um, now, the other, other thing is all of these uh, algorithms have different visualizations. So this is the results from the neural networks algorithm. And we can see quite clearly that it says the attribute, the value, and whether it favors attrition or not attrition. These visualizations are available. We can walk you through them um, if, you, if you need to. But um, it's we've got a lot of models. The things jump around a little bit. The idea of the neural network, networks model is that all of these things work together. So, for example, at the top, the top thing there is that if you're on Ontario, you're unlikely to treat. That's not particularly globally relevant, but it does feed into the model. The next one we see is that they never access the or will never access the forum. If they didn't do those things, they're getting very heavily weighted into the, they're probably going to a treat basket. So you take the aggregate of all these weighted values, neural networks mixes them together in a little bit of a complicated way, but, um, but uh, we get the end result. I'll pass back over to Nina. I think someone's coming down the stairs. It's Julie. <laughs> so we did have a lot of challenges throughout the project. Um, I'm just putting my project manager's hat on again. 
every day I said to the team, what have you achieved in the last 24 hours and what pro problems have we hit? And quickly running through, just to give you a feel for some of the, the issues, um, we knew up front the scheduling was an issue, so I've already spoken about that. There was a, there was a, there was a risk that we identified early that we weren't 100% sure we had enough data in terms of the, the length of our history. Um, we had enough data to be sufficiently predictive in the model. So that, that was a bit of a concern along the way as well. Um, we had some challenges Tim was going to talk about in the data mining. Is there anything you haven't covered there? We say small data set. Small data set in our terms is about 60,000 students, but in terms of what we're trying to do with that data, with the size of the attributes that we had, it's a bit small. We're still we're waiting. We're limited by the fact that we've only got a certain amount of history in the logs. We wanted to use that data because it was shown to be really important in the literature. So a couple more years of history will be doing this much better, hopefully. Um, and challenges throughout the project, the, the, one of the big challenges was that we, we didn't have, uh, our CRM is not widely used, so we didn't have like a full picture of who was contacting students, couldn't bring that into the model and we also, that limited us in our ability to roll this out beyond the student outreach team because without seeing the full picture of contact, you could very easily risk the top five high risk students being contacted by 20 different people. So that, that was a bit of a limitation. There was also some challenges in communicating some of the data mining concepts and we, some, some of the speakers mentioned this yesterday. To some degree, there's, you've got to build that trust in the model because it can be difficult to explain the model in a sensible way, particularly when there's a short time frame. So that, that was another challenge and we, I think we've still got some work to do in that area. Um, and I'd like to ask Pete to come up and just quickly go through, uh, just while he's walking up here, we don't have a definitive method at this point defined to say we are absolutely sure our model's working or it's not working. We have the historic testing data, but we, don't, we haven't defined how we're going to look at the, the, the actual pilot and say, yes, it's been a success or not. We do know who was contacted, so hopefully we'll be able to do that. Yeah. Um, I'll be very, very quick, because Simon's given me the air lie already. Um, <laughs> Throughout the course of 2014-30, about 900 students um, popped up as being at risk of attrition on the model. Uh, the student outreach team tried to call all these students. We kind of imported the data into Talisma. Uh, my team of student casuals gave them a call. Um, talked about our primary goal was to sign them up to a study coach, which is a, a weekly ongoing uh, mentoring type of uh, relationship with uh, one of our three study coaches. We signed up about 80 students for that. Um, those other students that we spoke to but couldn't sign up to study coaching, we gave some sort of advice based on um, what problems we thought they were having and what we could elicit over the phone. Sometimes that's a lot, sometimes that's not very much. Um, our very, very early analysis shows those students, the 80 students who had study coaches, only 2.5% of those withdrew throughout that session, which is really good. Um, the students who we spoke to is slightly worse than those students we couldn't speak to are treated close to the rates that we saw in that presentation. So some sort of intervention stops students dropping out. And uh, that's what we did. <coughs>